This is a galaxy-wide transmission of the United Federation of Planets. The United Federation of Planets Historical Society, in association with Memory Alpha, presents the Four Years' War. Stardate 2241.03. The planet Arcanus 4. Founded nearly a century before, this research outpost has grown into a flourishing, full-scale city. It is a shining example of Federation progress. There could be no Federation without Earth. And the fact that the humans could lead the formation of the Federation just a few years after their war with the Romulan Empire is nothing short of extraordinary. But it represents something very different to the Klingon Empire. Growing tired of diplomacy, their High Chancellor proclaims, if words were water, the humans would drown us all. The bad blood between the humans and the Klingons meant that the job of preventing war and leading the peace delegations fell to Vulcan. Regrettably, we failed. For 12 hours, the Klingon disruptors do not stop. Arcanus is reduced to rubble. Thousands of its inhabitants are dead. Countless more are missing. The first victims in what will come to be known as the Four Years' War. Expanding their empire for 200 years before the Federation was formed, that there would be a conflict with the Klingon people at some point was obvious to most of the members of Starfleet. The Klingons were certain that they could merely take anything they wanted. Starfleet's early losses did little to dissuade them of that notion. Coriana 6, Vesta, Arcanus. We took some major beatings the first six months. For most of that first year, our mission was just to slow them down while we fell back. Unfortunately, the Klingons were unconvinced the Federation was any sort of match for them, and their belief in their superiority left us little room to negotiate. Well, at that point, about the only thing we were doing that impressed the Klingons was dying well, and there was plenty of that. The Klingons' supreme commander, the architect of the invasions, was a warlord named Karn. Karn the Undying is what they called him. The Klingons revered him with good reason. Vulcan intelligence is, if I may say, unparalleled, but even for us, he was a mystery. It wasn't until the formation of the Federation that the High Council began to take Earth seriously. And even after the Federation was formed, many on the High Council thought it as a mere political alliance. Starfleet was never seen as a match for the Imperial Navy. Certainly not one that would impede the growth of the Empire. Their whole civilization, their whole culture, is a monument to the art of war. The early campaigns, yes, the Klingons were toying with us. They were using a strategy known to the Klingon people is which loosely roughly translates as the strategy of least respect the epitome of their arrogance 
entering the ambush of Invernus V. The Inverness system, as you call it, was our first objective. Inverness. Five planets, all colonized. Stardate 2243.3, the highly populated, dilithium-rich planets of the Inverness system. For your kind, those planets are merely a source of dilithium. For us, those planets are sacred. Goddamn Inverness 5. What a mess. It was the first time they used it on us. It was an old Klingon tactic. They had a word, uh, Noctowit, means the devourer. Day after day, it was the same thing. get called in to support some kind of counterattack. By the time I got into orbit, my orders had been changed. Attack called off. Battle was already over. We'd pull out of warp into a junkyard. Fragments of starships bouncing off my hull. Fragments of the crews as well. 18 starships destroyed. Pick up the survivors, beam them up. We'd be beaming them up and one of two things would happen. The transporters would blow out or the Klingons would show up and start shooting. I could look down from orbit and see trails of smoke. Well, that was it. Something had to change, or we were done. An Andorian acquaintance once said, don't push the pink skins to the thin ice. Wasn't very eloquent, but the Klingons found it to prove quite prophetic. After two years of almost constant defeat, the head of Starfleet, Admiral Slater, is forced to step down. Across the Federation, billions wonder who would replace him. I was on the bridge of the Xenophon. It was my first ship in the war. An old Markland-class destroyer. A Lieutenant Kane, our comms officer, said that there was a fleet-wide broadcast from Starfleet. I told him to punch it up on the big screen. And that's when we heard it was Ramirez. That name spread like wildfire. You ask anybody where they were when they heard it, and they'll remember. We are facing an enemy that is consumed and committed to our total destruction. His first speech to the Federation Council was incredible. An enemy that demands to be fought, and we will fight. There were 40,000 people in Archer Arena. But I say to you, our greatest challenge is not the might of a Klingon fleet. And they all wanted one thing. The greatest challenge laying before us is to do what must be done without undoing the dream of the Federation. Hope. For myself, I have but one fear. Destroying the dream of the Federation. Compared to such a loss, I do not fear the Klingon Empire! It was a good speech. Until I heard Admiral Ramirez speak. I had not foreseen the possibility of a peace between the Federation and the Klingons. Nor had I foreseen the possibility that the Federation might win. The battle cry of Admiral Ramirez sweeps across the Federation. The first goal was create a class of ship that could spring Starfleet back into action, back into battle. We had to leapfrog Klingon technology. It was called the Ares class. It was exactly what we needed. We had over a dozen member worlds working on it, 
It was the first pure warship that Starfleet had ever built. As for Vulcans, though we limited our contribution to propulsion, environmental, and defensive technologies, there were many who wanted us to end our participation in the war altogether. A Vulcan's gonna do what a Vulcan's gonna do. But the Andorians, they were happy to supply us the phasers. Starting 2244.1, near the planet Cygnus III. There will always be detractors who think you're taking the initiative too soon, that you're, you're rushing the offensive. I disagreed. The leadership of Admiral Ramirez is a welcome change, but his grand plan has yet to be tested in battle. We had the ships, and we had a core of battle-tested commanders. It was time to take the initiative. Well, that was Ramirez's first roll of the dice. And they landed exactly the way we wanted them to, the way we needed them to. The code name was Operation Pegasus. Pegasus was the first test of the Ares class against the ship it was designed to defeat, the D6. The Ares class looked good in simulations, real good. But data can only take you so far. The only true test for a combat vessel is combat. Relationships were unexpected. And then there was Garth. <laughs> that mad Isarian son of a bitch. That was his day. Garth likes to play down his contribution. Don't you believe it? What he did that day, no captain had ever done. We got lucky. It was Sonya's maneuver that gave me the opening. Sonya pulled a feint to starboard. Garth just went for it. It was like a Klingon maneuver. It was a new ship. They said she was tough. I want to see what she could take. After the Battle of Cygnus III, our ship captain started giving the Federation a stew as a worthy adversary. And for the first time, we took notice of Garth of Izar. It was a Klingon that gave me that name. I guess there are a lot worse things that a Klingon could call you. Yeah, sure, I'll tell you. They called me Queen Bitch Horror of the Federation. The Ares class had withstood its first trial by fire and passed to the gauntlet victorious. The Ares had proven itself, and it continued to prove itself. It was bigger, faster, more agile, drip-drop. And it was better armed than anything we'd had before. We had lost the advantage. At the time, Starfleet crews preferred to fight among their own kind. Crews might be Andorian, or Tellarite, or Vulcan, or human each of which had their own strategy and tactics. One never knew who you were fighting. And knowing one's enemy is the first rule of war. With the launch of their newer ships and the experience their commanders had gained, our progress was slowed. It was frustrating to fight Starfleet. Confident in their Ares cruisers, this brash corps of captains took back three systems in 30 days. But the war was not over yet. Stardate 2244.9, Starfleet's next generation heavy cruiser, is behind schedule. Admiral Ramirez himself arrives to deal with the problem when he receives a coded transmission from Starfleet intelligence. The Klingons were building something. Something big. We heard these rumors about the D7. We'd proven we could take on the Klingons. But the D7 changed all that. 
D7 would break the back of Starfleet. We had three shipyards across the Klingon Empire built there. If the Klingon High Council had listened to Karn, if the High Council had listened to me, they would have had D7s at Cygnus 3. The D7 would have been ready for battle. And all our new Ares class ships would have been cut to pieces. And we would have defeated the Federation. It had become an arms race, a war of technology. The new class of ship was proving more complicated than we realized. We needed more time. If the Klingons launched them first, we would have been outmatched and outgunned again. And by now, the Klingons had learned better than to squander that advantage. I needed another option. I went to my three best captains, Garth, Ribbo, Trask, and I asked them each for a plan of action. The Admiralty had three different plans. The first one wasn't worth spit. The second one uh, was a good plan, solid plan. But the third was Garth's. Garth asked me, out of the blue, if we could have a drink. That's when I told her I had an idea for a battle plan. My first reaction, let me just say this. I was really glad we were drinking. Garth and Sonia came into my quarters. I showed him a rough outline of my plan, and I said, what do you think? Sam sat there. He looked at it and looked at it, and then he looked at me. And he said, 100% insanity. A bloodbath waiting to happen. That was Axanar. Axanar. Its capture would put the Klingons within striking distance of Andoria. Teller Prime, Vulcan, and Terra. It is the heart of Federation space. Further, Karn spies discover that Starfleet's next generation heavy cruiser is being built in orbit over Axanar. This is his chance to destroy Starfleet's only match for the D7. Garth of Izar knows Axanar is a target that Karn cannot refuse. When Garth first presented his plan to battle the Klingons on Axanar, my first thought was how far he'd come. I mean, he was always an extraordinary explorer before the war. But I knew, in his heart, he was first a soldier. We didn't sign up to be warriors. That's not what Starfleet's about. We proved that we could do what we needed to do to defend the Federation. I'm proud of everyone who I served with, especially those that didn't make it back. So I signed off on the plan to end conflict with one final battle. To end it at Axanar. D7 was the ultimate expression of the Klingon warship. Technologically superior to anything in the quadrant. We would launch her and devastate the Federation fleet. Stardate 2245.1. The D7 enters the war.